So good morning, everyone. It's Monday, April 26, 9 a.m. It is uh, Monday of week seven. So what is due today? Um, uh, any module uh, six items, and that would be the medical language laboratory from module six, um, a quiz from module six, and um, a discussion from module six, which is um, the quiz. Now, look at your comments. Um, I have to reiterate, the assignment is not just make up any quiz. The assignment isn't cut and paste a, a case from the end of your book and then make up a quiz. The assignment is you look at the case, cut and paste the case, and then have questions based on the case. And um, I'm going to give more examples today. Uh, well, heck, let's start right now. Let's look at, um, um, let's look at, one of the previous chapters. And uh, I didn't grade uh, stuff from like uh, module six uh, just yet because I had a couple of students inform me over the weekend that um, they're having a little bit uh, glitchiness. They got a screenshot of uh, the glitchiness. So um, I'm, I'm gonna extend the due dates for module six stuff, but try to get it today. And if it doesn't work by 12 noon, um, uh, these students already have instructions to email me back and I'll, uh, I'll give you a, uh, a paper version of the assignment. So let's go into, let's give an example on if I were a student, how am I going to do my discussions to prepare for the final examination? Because the final examination isn't um, um, like the midterm. The midterm was um, very straightforward. Uh, cardiology, what is the meaning? What is the suffix? What is the prefix? That, that ship has sailed and gone. What are we doing now? We're doing something that, what's emoji reactions? You go into medical records and any back of uh, any chapter that we did, and we find something. Here you go. Here's a case. I'm going to take the case. Oops. I don't know how to copy and paste, apparently. You take the case and uh, then I open up my Microsoft Word or I put it directly inside the um, uh, inside the assignment. So I have something like this. Now I'm going to take out the superfluous extra stuff, stuff that's not important to me. So this is a, a referral letter, right? So I'm now going to highlight some of the things that look good that look like um, uh, medical terminology. So she had a chief complaint of allergic rhinitis. Um, she also had nasal obstruction. Previously, she found uh, mechanical obstruction, secondary to septal deformity, and turbinate hypertrophy. These are medical terms. You see what I'm doing? I'm looking at, right, all the all the um, nice medical terminologies I could ask a question about. She also had watery rhinorrhea, burning of the eyes, uh, exacerbates in the spring and summer months, right? So uh, experiencing symptoms again at this time. Uh, and, um, and there may be, uh, there's nothing that would suggest recurring, recurrent rhinitis. So, Let's just take that part as an example. So if I'm writing a question, here's my question. We see here there's a chief complaint. Um, uh, Ms. Harding uh, goes, or which of the following is a chief complaint? And we could write, uh, she had, inflammation uh, and or infection of her uh, nose, inflammation and or infection of her ears, 
inflammation and or infection uh, of her eyes and uh, oh, um, what inflammation and or infection of her sinuses. Or, listen, let me be tricky of her septum. Uh, of her uh, septal deformity. This is for someone who's not paying attention. Okay. So when we look at this, we have to look at our question. Does it relate back to the, the specific case? Yes. Does it relate back to a specific um, a medical terminology? Yes. So what would the answer be? Anybody? If I go, it goes, it goes, would it be inflammation and or infection of the nose, ears, eyes, or would it be uh, a part of the septal, de septal deformity? What's the answer? Inflammation or infection of the nose? Nose, right? So this, let's make it in red. This would be the answer. Now, when you're doing a multiple choice examination for the exam, what do you do? You read the question. Now, if it was a chief complaint, isn't that the first thing that the, um, that the patient talks about? Why did the patient come in? So that's one kind of question, the chief complaint. Another kind of question is, can we talk about the history, right? Where was the obstruction? Was it in her eyes, ears? And of course, it was nasal. Uh, uh, where was, um, what happened to the turbinates in her nose? Hypertrophy is what? Uh, which of the following? Uh, 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 which of the following happened due to uh, uh, oh, on mechanical because uh, which of the following was the cause of the mechanical because uh, mechanical destruction? So you find the word mechanical destruction, right? It's right there. Secondary to septal deformity, turbinate hypertrophy. So hypertrophy, we know that word, right? So do you think I could have a question on an exam? And this is what, this is actually how you should really be studying. If you know the format of the exam, if you know how the fight is gonna go down, this is how you train for the fight. And it's what, turbinate, hyper, uh, turbinate hyper, hypertrophy. But I'm not gonna ask turbinate hypertrophy. That would be too easy. What would I say? Um, uh, the turbinate, uh, the turbinates in her nose, uh, shrank. The turbinates in her nose swole, uh, uh, sw swelled. That's the best, right? Uh, both, neither. That's a typical question that you'll see on the final. And this is a typical, um, NCLEX type question. I switched it up because it's too easy. Hypertrophy, hyper, increase, trophy, growth. Uh, to be honest with you, the old exams, my 12-year-old aced it, right? I had a, I had a bet 10 years ago. Uh, I had a class who told me I made the final too hard, which, by the way, I used to make my finals a lot harder than I do now. But uh, my, they're more friendlier now. Uh, but um, I had a bet, and at the time, Chanel was... Yeah, it was about 10 years ago. It was in another school. Chanel was 12. Uh, she aced, she aced a, um, you know, a typical hypertrophy versus septoplasty versus rhinorrhea question. This is a college question right here. And the way you do your discussions goes is the way you train. So don't you think you can, you can pretty much this week, don't you think you can go over every chapter that we ever had and then go over every case that we ever had and, and pretty much figure out every question that I could ever ask. You could do that, couldn't you? And that's how you get an A on, that's how you get an A on the final. And that's how you beat finals. And that's how you beat exams. That's actually how you should study for your T's, right? You look, you, uh, you pick apart. And isn't that what the T's does? You pick apart um, um, a little uh, story and then there's three or four questions that relate directly to the story. But when they, when they ask the question, it isn't direct. It isn't, what is hypertrophy? They'll ask you, what happened? And what was the cause of this and that? 
And this is a more realistic question on what the doctor or nurse or medical professionals ask. Because everyone knows about turbinate hypertrophy, but they need to know, okay, it goes, uh, was there mechanical destruction and what caused it? Well, she had septal defect and also her turbinates probably were all, um, were all swollen up. So what happened? What did we do for her? That's another question. What's the management? Well, they did septoplasty. And we know plasty is what? What's the suffix of plasty? What did we do to her nose? Or specifically the septum, which is the part um, in between that separates your left and right um, nostril. So septoplasty, we never saw that word before, but we already know what plasty means. So what did we do to her nose? Anybody? Did we remove anything? Did we sew anything up? What'd we do? That's a nice third question. Which of the following was the management for, uh, uh, for her um, septal deformity? Did we remove her septum? Suture her septum? Uh, burn her septum? Or repair her septum? Oops, don't know how to spell. Is it repair? Yep, it is. Because remember, rhinoplasty is a what? If you remember my week two notes, if you looked at the notes and you retained it, rhinoplasty is a nose job. Mammoplasty is a, you know, um, whether whatever you do with your breast. But you notice the word plasty, it means repair. So this is a more realistic medical terminology question. This is more of a realistic, uh, since the majority of you are planning to be nurses and beyond, and I hope so, right? Um, this is a, a better question. Um, instead of saying, what does septoplasty mean? That's, that's, that's two dimensional. I could do that with rhinorrhea. I could do that with the recurrent sinusitis. So sinusitis, did it have inflammation or infection of what? The sinuses which we showed on um, the other week's lecture that it was the holes in your head, um, the spaces in your head. That's why when you get sinusitis, if anyone ever had a really, uh, re like a really bad cold, your head feels like a bowling ball because all the spaces in your skull, which are supposed to be clear of any mucus or pus or anything like that, they're all filled with water. And that's inflammation or infection of your sinuses and if something's recurrent, that means it keeps on coming back, okay? So when you're preparing, this is what you do. And even though you're assigned only one, you know what you should do? Well, it goes what I would do if I was still a student. Well, actually, it's what I actually do uh, as a current student. Um, like, for example, I have, uh, I have over 200 business case studies from, um, uh, for uh, my final exam in about three weeks. Do you know how many case studies I went over? More than 500. And you know what I did? I looked at patterns. I looked at what the professor liked, what kind of cases uh, she likes. And you know, you know what she likes? It goes, she likes cases that have been, um, that have shown, um, uh, what do you call that? Where the CEO or the chief financial officer um, did something clever and did something different. So when I looked at all the cases, the case that, uh, that didn't match the profile, what did I do? I just put it aside. But the cases that did match the profile, what do I do? I studied it like my life depended on it and did what I just showed you. I took it all apart. And, and I asked myself, from the history, since I've already known this professor already now, I've been in her class. This is like currently week uh, in, at, uh, at Mason, they have, um, uh, it's, it runs in 15, 16 week cycles. It's already uh, week 12, week 13. If I don't know and can't predict her yet, then it's not really her fault. It's really my fault, right? And even, even in graduate school um, and with the limited time we all have, because all of you, uh, all of you uh, are, have way too much on your plate to be guessing on what's gonna be on an exam, right? So take advantage of this 100 level class uh, which is uh, simpler, right, and more straightforward, and apply these techniques because you're going to need them for the rest of your life. 
um, and and see how short the cases are. When you move up and on, you guys see in medical charts, they're huge. They're in the dozens of pages, right? And um, uh, the secret to what's wrong with our patient buried in those words somewhere. So, and that's what I'm hoping that you guys, what skill set you guys start to develop because it, it takes time. So does anyone have any questions on how to do the assignment? Um, and uh, I, I goes, and, and what we're really doing when we're doing these assignments, it's not busy work. It's, it's something to help you learn how to prepare for exams. And if you know the format of the exam, which this format is in, done in what they call a clinical vignette format, meaning it gives you a little story and then four or five questions that relate to that story. And you'll see it when um, um, I make um, the practice exam available um, uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay, and uh, do, 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 what's the other thing? Oh yeah, the other thing I also have to mention, um, we caught two nurses, nursing students last week cheating, and I caught two more on my classes cheating this, this weekend. Gang, this is a little uh, side note. If you want to cheat, go ahead. You get caught, you get caught. You don't, you don't. But I can promise you, when you're working in the field, you get caught, they will have absolutely zero mercy on you. Actually, they'll make an example of you. And, and they will do it in the most publicly grotesque manner possible. And I always tell this story and bear with me. I had a really good friend of mine. He was a fifth generation surgeon. And we were in medical school together. And he was in a, um, medi a medical school has fraternities and sororities, but they're academic fraternities and sororities. Well, his was infamous for cheating. He used to brag that he cheated on his boards. He cheated on this. And he and I were near the bottom of our class and always in trouble academically. And uh, one day he gave me, he said, uh, one of my fraternity brothers is the teaching assistant for the department of neurology. I got an exam because you're failing neurology. They're going to, it's a, one of the major courses in medical school. If you fail that, they're going to kick you out and they're going to take all your money. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to get kicked out of here, I'm going to get kicked out of here on my own merit. All right. So thanks, but no thanks. So we both took the test. He aced it and he got to move on. And I barely passed it. And then I had to take something called a remedial exam, meaning in one week, I have to do better, at least 10% better on the score, even though the score is passing. That's how high the standard is in medical school. Even if you pass, if you have consistent low pass, they retrain you to see if you will get a better grade. And if you don't, they kick you out. So fast forward, right? I was in second year residency. So it was BIMS. So that's his nickname, Bimby. Right. So I heard that, hey, do you know so and so? And I go, yeah, it's Bimby. We went to medical school together. Yeah, he just got charges. And I go, what? And I go, he falsified documents and um, he, faked a, he faked a report. And then when they looked at the rest of his charts, he faked a whole bunch of reports. And out of the reports, two of them were fatalities that he directly caused. So he's not only getting charges, he's getting criminal charges. Now, fast forward, he's living in his mom's basement. After 20 years of training and all of that, what at the end of the day, what was he? He's a cheater and a liar. He's a good friend of mine, but I lost touch with him. And I, I feel really bad uh, because he didn't learn the one lesson. We're all in this business to be honest and to be ethical. And if you're not, um, and um, I got this on recording, that's my two cents because I'm hoping that the people who, who did stuff either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, please learn that lesson, please, because if uh, um, Stratford University won't teach you that lesson, uh, and there are two nurses now who are no longer in the program because they refused to learn that lesson, and they were given multiple chances to own up, and they did not. And I can tell you, Dr. Lexima, she and I are from the same system, New York City. It is brutal, and um, there, and we both worked in the Bronx during very, very bad times. Um, she has little to no tolerance, and so do I. I, I guess I, I don't think any of that is clever. I'd rather just fail out than, than do something. So that's my two cents. So please, 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 if you're having trouble academically, call upon your academic advisor. Call upon uh, uh, your professor if you're not doing so hot. 
or if you're feeling pressure. Even if you're doing well and you're feeling pressure, please call upon us. Take advantage of, we, we also have free counseling, Well Connect. Please, no one takes advantage of that, but everyone talks about mental disease. All my students who are in academic trouble say the same thing. I'm, I feel pressured. I'm, 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 I'm having a really hard time, right? So uh, it, is, it is a professional that looks, looks for help consistently and, and gets it, right? So, and, and you guys know, I'm a, I'm a definite proponent of, uh, of therapy. I'm, I'm a definite proponent of getting help when you need it and getting help often. So this week, what's due for uh, what's due in module seven, musculoskeletal system. So let's now this particular um, chapter. This is really great for those of you who are uh, uh, haven't yet taken their anatomy and physiology, because one of the uh, one of the pet peeves that I have from students for the A and P class is that. There's so many terms to memorize. It's only 10 weeks and you're making me memorize thousands of terms. And I'm not exaggerating. I counted for musculoskeletal, which is um, um, three, three chapters and two weeks worth of lectures in anatomy and physiology. It's thousands of things you have to memorize, which by the way, it's still at the basic level. You all don't want to know yet on, uh, when you go to graduate school, how much worse it's going to get. But for here, if you learn it at this level, memorize it, get it in uh, your long-term memory, it should be good. So who deals with the musculoskeletal system? Well, a whole bunch of people. But the first is a surgical service called orthopedics. They are a subspecialty of surgery, so they take surgery, uh, and then they take uh, orthopedic surgery, and they deal with musculoskeletal problems, usually damage, and they usually manage the, the patient's case uh, with uh, surgical means. You know, they put pins and um, they saw, and first time ever in my life that I, I've been in surgery uh, when, uh, when I had my orthopedics rotation in medical school and in uh, residency where, uh, you know, they have actual power tools and they have to uh, break into bone, cut into bone and, and, and do repair. Now the joint space, that's the function of the rheumatologist. And they are a subspecialty of the Department of Internal Medicine. So again, someone who does four to five years of internal medicine, then they go into RUMA and do three more years. And then they become a fellow and then board certification. Um, I have a good friend of mine, she's a rheumatologist. She's what, 48? She just finished her training two years ago. That's a long time, right? And uh, we're not, uh, we, like those sub people who have specialties are not spring chickens. They've been around the block more than once. And a rheumatologist, think the person who deals with arthritis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, any of the inflammation or infections of the joint space. Now, chiropractic medicine, I have a really good shooting partner, uh, my, uh, my friend, Dr. Dan. Dr. Dan, we both get called doctor, but uh, he does chiropractic, uh, uh, he's a chiropractor. If you ever need a really good one, he practices out of Annandale. Uh, just shoot me, uh, shoot me um, uh, I'll give you a referral. But he doesn't do the same things that I do and he didn't go to the school uh, uh, the same amount of years uh, that I did, but he does a lot of things with uh, what they call modalities. And it is part of the alternative, the list of, um, departments that are alternative medicine. So they don't do drugs or surgery. They do, they do like stretching and movements uh, because uh, uh, there's a lot of things um, that a lot of ailments that relate to your body's joints and musculoskeletal and your chiropractor does that. Does anybody here, uh, did anybody ever uh, avail of uh, maybe a chiropractor uh, session? Anybody here who did any... Uh, you know, uh, they crack your back and your neck and, and all these things. Anybody? No. No, you never tried it? Uh, I tried out, especially uh, some of the stretching. Um, um, especially if you're like me, you're overweight. Uh, even though I work out regularly, I have, um, because when you get bigger, 
Uh, those of you ladies who uh, were uh, um, ha had children know this, right? When you get bigger, what happens? What happens to your posture? It gets, uh, you know, uh, that heavy weight in the front starts pulling on your sacral spine. And uh, every once in a while, every three or four months, I go to Dan and uh, he does a, a couple of procedures and it totally clears up my thing, but clears up my, uh, my back and some of my joint. And he now has me on a daily stretching regimen. Um, I gained like something like 55, 60 pounds uh, during COVID. And during the summer, I was so big that I couldn't pick up stuff off the floor and I, I'd make my kids go pick it up. But now since I'm being, uh, I've, it's been like a month, I've been on the stretching regimen from this chiropractic medicine. Um, it's really great. I can pick up stuff by myself. I actually uh, ran up the stairs for the first time in, in, in more than a year. I usually just, you know, uh, lumber up the stairs, but because you start losing weight, you start stretching and these people can get you back on track. So they, everyone has their place, but if it's really, really serious, of course, you go to orthopedics. If you have a medical condition like arthritis, if you have any one of these, you go to the rheumatologist, but chiropractic medicine, they do a lot. And also, um, uh, Dr. Dan and I really, uh, hit it off because both of us, he was a boxer when he was a kid. And I was in martial arts, uh, and um, uh, we met. His son was uh, at a boxing match, and uh, um, uh, my son was in an MMA tournament in the, in the next door. And we met. We met years ago, and uh, we both uh, were were both proponents of exercise and and movement. Um, because remember, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Um, try try like. Um, for those of you who have a job like mine, sitting right here on the screen all day, every day, it, it, it ruins your back, ruins everything. So it, it's not surprising that I gained 55. I'm not exaggerating. I gained 55 pounds. That's why the picture that you see um, uh, for Zoom is totally different uh, than what I look like now. Uh, um, well, not totally different, but uh, it's significantly different. Now, back to what I was talking about here. Uh, about how this can help you in anatomy and physiology exams. If you look at all these words, this is not English. So how am I supposed to memorize all of these? Well, let's give you some examples. So if you use your medical terminology powers, let's look at some shapes. Does everyone see here that this is like a triangle? And the Greek, um, uh, the Greek symbol for uh, delta is the triangle. So this is your deltoid. Oid is the suffix meaning um, resembling. So resembling what? Resembling a triangle. And that's your deltoid. You also have, uh, what's another one that's a shape? You see here, I call them riblets. You know, in bodybuilders and people who are skinny, like my sons. My sons all have riblets because they're all skinny. I can't wait until they're 50 and fat. That's going to entertain me so right here that's your serratus because and what's something that's serrated it's like doesn't it look like a little knife like that like a you know like a um a bread knife and those are serrations so this is called your uh, uh serratus there's also directions rectus you know if you have an erector set or if uh something is erect it's standing tall or standing straight so your rectus abdominis muscles have to be what those straight muscles. My rectus uh, femoris, which is somewhere up here, right? That's the straight muscle in your femur. So femur, right? Your humerus or your brachium, which is your upper arm. So that's your brachialis, brachioradialis. Brachio means upper arm. Your radial bone is right here on your forearm. So that's the muscle that's brachioradialis, okay? Mastic uh, mastication is chewing. So you have some muscles that um, look almost like the word that they're, uh, the action that it's doing. So everyone put your palm on your face and pretend you're chewing. You feel that muscle, right? Right, uh, right in your cheeks, that's your masseter. And it's used for mastication. And if you take a good look at your, again, another shape, your eyeballs and your mouth, 
those are circular muscles. And what's an orb? It's a circular thing. So your orbicularis oculi has to be the circular muscles around your eye. Your orbicularis oris has to be the circles around your uh, mouth. Here, you have the frontalis because it's in the front of my head, right? My temporalis, which is in my, near my temples. So there's a lot of things here, right? That if you know your uh, medical terminology powers, you could figure stuff out. For example, here's another one. My biceps brachii, bi means two. So I'm looking at the two muscles in my uh, biceps. But if you look at your triceps, that's tri, one, two, three. There are three muscles back here. Look at the biceps femoris. One, two. And if you look at it, goes, uh, there's also your quadriceps. Quad means four. So there are four muscles here in your thigh. Your quadriceps, your quadriceps are uh, uh, covering your femur or your thigh bone, which is the largest, longest bone in your body. So you could see the advantages. And again, if you're in uh, my anatomy and physiology class, it goes, I put out uh, pictures. What can you do with the pictures? Can you erase all of these? If you know it's an anatomy class, you know there's going to be a diagram and it's going to be A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So what do you do all day? Right? Every day, take five, 10 minutes and uh, memorize a couple of diagrams. And then by the time you get to the exam, what happens? Um, I've had people finish my anatomy and physiology finals in 20 minutes because they trained for weeks and weeks and weeks. All they did was look at the pictures and then they, they pretty much like memorized everything. And the way you get things into memory is what? Constant repetition, constant training. And yes, seven days a week, find a way. Now, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. we have one more person who just came in. Let me mark you down. Now let's look at some, <clears throat> some words. Fascioplasty, we already know plasty, surgical repair of your fascia. Do you see here how the muscles come down here and then they're wrapped around and then you have this tendon right over here? That whole covering is your fascia. So if I break a bone or rip any of these muscles here, I also have to repair that fascia and that covering, and that's a fascioplasty. Fibroma, they're a tumor of fibrous tissue, could be cancerous, could not be cancerous. We don't know yet. We got to do a biopsy. But typically, fibromas are relatively benign, but when they grow out of control, we got to go deal with it. Lyomyoma, you have smooth muscle and you have striated muscle. The smooth muscle, let me show you a picture. Instead of just pretending. Here you go. There's three kinds of muscles. You have skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and uh, cardiac muscle. If you look at skeletal muscles, do you see how there's like these stripes? They're striated. So you can control these. Smooth muscle, also known as visceral muscle, see they're like wavy and there's no stripes. You can't control smooth muscle. Um, like for example, when I swallow something, can you stop it? Once it starts going down your esophagus, once you chew something and you swallow it, once it starts going down, it's really hard to stop it. And that's smooth muscle. Or when you're at a meeting and your stomach makes these funny gurgling noises, that's smooth muscle. Same thing with your blood, uh, your, your hypertension. Can you sit there and try to do Jedi mind trick to yourself and try to lower your blood pressure? You can, but it's really, really hard because what controls all of that? Smooth muscle. And the same thing, cardiac muscle. Can't control how fast your heart rate goes, right? Well, relatively, right? So you can control this, but you can't control these two. And smooth muscle, if I had a uh, tumor of smooth muscle, that's called lyomyoma. And if it was um, a um, malignant tumor, lyomyosarcoma, which is not a good thing. Lumbosacral, lum lumbar, which is the loins or the lower part of your back, right? 
which uh, Dr. Dan did a lovely, lovely job on my back a couple months ago. But you know what else did what really great on my lumbo costal area or the lower back uh, uh, and costal is pertaining to my uh, ribs. Um, I, I only lost like maybe five or six pounds, but that was more than enough to alleviate some of the pressure and alleviate some of the pain. Muscular pertaining to muscle, myo pertaining to uh, uh, muscle, myorexis. Sometimes we have to, uh, if my patient um, uh, broke a bone or, you know, they're an athlete or doesn't even have to have, be an athlete to rupture or rip a muscle. You can easily do that by either exercising or, um, you know, uh, if you're in an emergency, like my uncle totally ruined his back. He was trying to catch one of my babies because they were, you know, they were on the jungle gym or whatever and doing some stupid, but he's an old guy and he tried to reach for uh, my kid and I don't know. And he had a little bit of myorexis. He, his muscles uh, ripped a little bit, but fortunately for him, he only had to go through uh, physical therapy and didn't have to do surgery. That's what you get when you're 80 plus start trying to ca keep up with two-year-olds, especially my two-year-old. Tenotomy. If my tendon, right, uh, is damaged, I have to cut into it to repair it. So I cut into it first. That's called the tenotomy in order to perform something called a, a tendoplasty. And that's surgical repair of a tendon. And what is a tendon? A tendon is um, like that fascia that, uh, that connects, like here, there's a tendon that connects uh, bone to muscle. So if I have tendonitis, it could be a joint, it, it's a joint problem slash muscle problem slash bone problem all at once. Myalgia, pain or tenderness in the muscle, which by the way, those of you who are going back to the gym, it's, it's natural. And, and every once in a while you should, this is how you know you're wasting your workouts. If, if on your heavy day, alternate between a heavy day and a light day, if you have a heavy day or a supposed heavy day, and then you wake up the next morning and they're not a little bit sore, you're doing it wrong. That means you're uh, what my coach used to call, you're milking it. You're not doing the work. You're not really, really working. Uh, um, uh, Saturday was my uh, heavy day. Uh, um, man, Sunday morning was not pleasant. I had myalgia. I had some um, um, muscle pain, but it's a good pain. Uh, when it starts becoming really bad is when you can't move. Uh, that's not a good thing. But is that fibromyalgia? Ever, yeah, fibromyalgia is different. Fibers, right, now uh, um, intervene uh, in your muscles and the nerves, and it causes a great amount of pain. Uh, and then my patient can't move very well, and then they don't move very well, and then the pain gets worse, the fibers get worse. It's, uh, it's, it's a very, very chronic, very difficult thing to deal with. But the myalgia I'm talking about is, you know, you get a little bit sore, you know, uh, and that's what your workouts should do. You, 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 it, um, you know, when they say no pain, no gain, not in pain, pain, but a little bit of myalgia uh, is actually um, a good thing. And when, the days that I have heavy days and my heavy days are like uh, I jog walk for an hour and then uh, lift for another 30, 30 minutes or so. And um, at the, I do, uh, you know, a lot of people do three sets. I do five, uh, but lower weights because I'm getting old and I have osteoarthritis. I don't have, I don't I have rheumatoid arthritis and gout. So I got to be careful um, because if you, you got to modify your stuff when you get older, it's just, it's just uh, something that you got to do. Myasthenia. Weakness or debility. Now, myasthenia is uh, is most commonly used in this disease state called myasthenia gravis, where you it's an autoimmune disease where your um, your body attacks um, the acetylcholine, which is uh, your neurotransmitter that helps your muscles move. And if that happens, the weakness gets so bad by uh, by early by by late morning, you won't be able to breathe. So that's how dangerous myasthenia gravis is. But if you're just, if your patient's just having normal myasthenia, that's uh, just regular weakness uh, of the muscle. Myopathy, it could be from a myopathy or a disease in your muscle, like 
like muscular just like muscular dystrophy is one that fibromyalgia it has pain but uh it also has weakness because the pain is masking uh uh the weakness and you know when something's hurt when something hurts can you move it and hence you know all the signs and symptoms hemiplegia it's paralysis of one side of the body now what is plesia or what does paralysis mean? Let's look at the word. Let's look at what the sign. Okay. So this is your spine and let's look at a better version of it here. If you look at here, your spine houses your uh, spinal, co uh, spinal cord. Out of your spinal cord comes spinal nerves. And they start all the way up here in your cervical spine and they go all the way down here to your coccyx uh, in this uh, thing called your cauda equina. So all these, these nerves come out. What would happen if I took a knife and cut all the way down where this redness is? You won't have a signal that goes to all your skeletal muscles you probably won't even feel anything because there's also signals that have to go up and tell your brain what's going on in the rest of your body. And that's called paralysis. So, whoops. So depending on where you got cut or where is the damage, you could have quadriplegia, which is affects what? One, two, three, four of your limbs. You could be paraplegic, which can affect from your waist on down or your just your legs on down, okay? And it depends where the spinal damage is. If it's cervical, that's why when um, you get into an auto accident, we put a cervical collar on your neck because there could be a potential uh, C4, C6. And I believe I told you guys a story. This this one one, one dude had a tractor truck accident and, and it, it went end over end. He came walking out of his tractor trailer with his, uh, with his neck totally broken. And we were all screaming at him to stop. Fortunately for him, uh, he had uh, several fractures here, but it did not sever the spinal cord. So quadriplegia, think what? One, two, three, four limbs. Paraplegia, think what? Either from the waist or from the chest down. And hemiplegia, think either left or right. And those are the different plesias or the different paralysis because para means alongside, lysis means break down. So if I break down all those spinal nerves alongside my spinal cord, we got a real problem, okay? And that's uh, your plesias or that's your paralysis, plural. Rafi, myorophy, right? I did a suture. Let's say, uh, you know, I'm a... Uh, uh, let's say we have a patient who's a football player and they had some uh, myorexis. So they had some rupture of the, you know, of some of the muscles. So what will the surgeon do? Myorophy. And um, a lot, uh, a lot of the really good surgeons out there, especially orthopedics, they're hooked up with um, sports teams because those are the people who are going to rip themselves up the most. I have a classmate of mine, Dr. Gaddy. Uh, he is uh, he is their main orthopedist for the um, uh, um, Olympic Committee. So if our Olympic athletes get hurt, right? He's based out of Los Angeles. Uh, if they get hurt, he he's the one who sews them all up. Myosarcoma. Remember, sarcoma is fleshy tissue tumor, and it's highly malignant. So if you have a myosarcoma, your patient's in a lot of trouble. Um, these are nice. These are nice. Oh, these are also important as well is the movements, which you will, you'll also be going over in anatomy and physiology. And if my patient can't do movements, certain movements, then we have to document it. And this is where this comes in. So decrease an angle, right? If you see here, remember in um, high school, you were thinking, when am I going to use geometry? I'm never going to need that in a million years. Guess what? We're going to talk about geometry right now. If you're looking at this plane right here, the angle from here to here is 180 degrees. 
But if my patient here brings her arm up like this, this is 90 degrees and this is like 45 degrees. So the angle of the joint of her elbow, right, is getting smaller. So that's called flexion. And if she reaches out, the angle will be getting longer to, to 180 degrees. So that will be extension. So flexion and extension, they go together. Flexion, decrease the joint. Extension, increases the angle of the joint. Abduction and adduction. This is a tricky one. But if you look at it, it is in perspective of the patient's midline. So if I am adding my limb, either my arm or my leg to midline, that is called adduction. But if I am moving it away from the midline, that's called abduction. So think about abduction. You're taking something away. Ab, A-B, the prefix means away, right? So abduction is my patient's moving or can't move to midline. And if any of you ever had a groin pull of um, uh, any of your muscles here, you definitely can't what? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the muscles on the outside of here, if, it, if you had a Charlie horse, you definitely can't move your um, um, move your your leg outward, such as that. Rotation, of course, you're rotating. Pronation and supination. Now, that gets complicated, but I, I, I make it, I decomplicate things in my life. So pronation, palms down. So if you put your palm down on, um, on a table, that's pronation. And the exact opposite is supination. Eversion, for all of you uh, who love wearing your high heels at the club or at a lovely dinner function, you ever like uh, wobble a little bit and then your, your ankle kicks out that way? That's called eversion. But if it kicks inward, that's called inversion. And it could cause a nice sprain or strain in here. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Again, I simplify my life. Where do you put plants? You put them into the ground. So that's when my patient is pointing at the ground. That's plantar flexion. Okay. This is uh, important to know the difference between dorsiflexion and plantar flexion for uh, when you test um, reflexes such as the Babinski planar reflex. If you've ever seen that on TV or in the emergency room where the doctor takes a pen or um, um, pen, pen light or, you know, um, the bottom part of the reflex hammer and we stroke the foot. And if it, if it dorsiflex and fans out, that means my patient has a spinal cord injury, which is serious. <clears throat> Again, we won't be memorizing the bones for this class, but you'll see some patterns. Carpals, tarsals, metacarpals, metatarsals, phalanges and phalanges. So toes and fingers, that's a beautiful both A and B question. They both mean, uh, uh, phalanges both mean fingers and toes. But how do I distinguish what's a, um, uh, what's a finger, what's a toe? Um, on a report, it would say phalanges, upper extremity, phalanges, lower extremity. And um, we number the, uh, the digits. So your thumb is one, pointing finger is two, middle finger is three, ring finger is four, and your pinky is five. So if I say fracture of the distal, uh, distal digit number one, um, right upper extremity, that means my patient's right thumb. And you could see there's proximal parts, parts closer to the wrist or closer to midline, and there's distal parts right here on the distal or distant part of the fingers. So carpals think wrist, tarsals think ankle, right? And phalanges, both toes and fingers. Cervix, we already talked about cervical pertaining to your neck. Remember we talked about the cervical column, I mean, cervical collar and also C4, C6 fractures. That means your cervical four vertebrae or cervical number six. Costal, we already went, means ribs. Your subcostal area, it's underneath your ribs or your intercostal area or your intercostal space. For those of you, anybody here uh, uh, know EKG or had some EKG training? You remember your intercostal spaces. That's the thing you measure up to where you put the electrodes or the stickers, 
those little stickies, what what people like calling stickies. They're called electrodes. It's my it's one of my pet peeves when people call them stickies. Craniotomy, Tommy, to cut what into your skull. It's not really cutting into your skull. We kind of drill into it, and it's usually to uh, alleviate intracranial pressure, because if you have any damage to your skull, um, let's look at it. See, if you look at your skull, hmm, where's a nice picture? Oh, here, maybe, hmm, let's see, let's look at this. So if you, if you look at your skull and let's look at a brain, oh, here's a better. If you look at your skull and here's your brain, right? You see, it's all covered in cerebral spinal fluid. So all around here, see this little tiny little space here? That's all fluid. Now, what happens if I bonk myself on the head and I got some fracture and all these blood vessels start bleeding? It's going to take the pressure here and it's going to increase it. Now, the bad thing is you have a section of your brain here, which is all the way back here in your cerebellum. And that's in charge of breathing and blood pressure. So when that pressure starts pushing, it's gonna push on this part and it's gonna tell your brain, hey, you know what? Let's shut everything down. So we drill a hole to alleviate that blood or pus or, or, or any of that pressure or any of the swelling. That's actually our greatest fear is the swelling of the brain uh, upon um, head trauma. And that's the thing we, uh, we can have to control quite quickly. Your humerus or your funny bone, which is your upper arm, also known as your brachium. We already discussed that earlier. Uh, metacarpectomy, if I want to remove some of my carpal bones, especially if there is a comminuted fracture, it's in pieces. I, got, I usually take that out. Uh, not me, but the orthopedic surgeon. Phalangitis, inflammation or infection of any one of your phalanges, whether it be your fingers or your toes. Spondylitis, inflammation or infection of your vertebra, which is your backbone, which isn't a good thing because you have your spinal cord in there and your spinal nerves are exiting your, your, uh, your vertebrae. So if that gets all swelled up, don't you think it's going to start pinching on things? Sternocostal. We're not only, we're talking not only about the sternum or your breastbone, but the ribs associated with it. Your calcaneum, which is your heel bone. So you could have calcanidinia, common with runners, uh, common with people with, uh, uh, who are heavier. Um, that's why I, until I get my weight down, I'm not allowed to run outside because I'm, I'm so heavy that it, it bashes up my knees and my feet. Um, femoral pertaining to your femur or your thigh bone. Remember, we mentioned that a little bit earlier. That's the largest, uh, uh, longest bone in your body. So if you break your femur, <clears throat> the only time I saw people break their femur, uh, they had to be hit by something big, like a truck. And the last two patients of mine, one was like a UPS truck. The other one I think was FedEx. Can't remember. It's more than, it was more than 10 years ago. Fibula, your tib fib, your fibula. Uh, those are your bones of your lower leg. And there's two of them. There's your tibia and your fibula. And the tibia is the one in the front. Hence the term tib fib fracture. So a tib fib fracture means it not only broke the tibia, which is the front part. It also broke the fibula, which is the back part. Patella is your kneecap. Sometimes we, uh, especially with uh, athletes, uh, uh, patellectomy is uh, required. And then we replace it with um, uh, plastics and all these other things. It's amazing uh, what, how much damage an athlete can have in their joint space and how orthopedics, uh, especially sports medicine, and sports medicine is a sub sub category of the Department of Orthopedics. Those are people specializing in the, the classic and typical damages of an athlete. Pelvimetry, pelvis, right? Uh, your hips and pelvimetry is the measurement of the dimensions uh, of the pelvis. It's typically done 
uh, um, by ultrasound for um, uh, anybody in obstetrics. Radiograph, it's a fancy word for x-ray. And that is the main, um, one of the main diagnostic tools of the Department of Orthopedics. You look at, um, uh, you deal with uh, the Department of Radiology all day uh, and uh, um, um, regarding um, x-rays. We already talked about tibia, ankylosis. It means stiffness or crookedness. So if you, uh, it's classic in the term ankylos ankylosing spondylitis. So um, we already mentioned spondylitis up here. Where is it? I thought I did. Did we mention spondylitis? Well, your, your vertebrae, right? Inflammation of your vertebrae, don't you think that's gonna cause some stiffness and crookedness in your back? And that's called ankylosis. Joint space is arthur, arthritis. So if I perform an arthroscopy, which I am due, I'm not looking forward to that, right? That's when they scope or uh, put holes in my knee and then um, put a fiber optic tube in there and they go looking around for things. Because I have a lot of chondritis, cartilage damage and inflammation, especially in my left knee. But costochondritis is the cartilage in your ribs. Let's look at ribs real quick. Your ribs aren't solid. They have a solid portion. Ooh, now I'm hungry. I should have wrote ribs anatomy. If you look at your anatomy of your ribs, and you'll learn these terms true, false ribs, floating, right? You see this? This is all cartilage here in blue. Cartilage is just like bone, but it, it doesn't have um, a lot of uh, minerals like magnesium sulfate and calcium carbonate. That's what makes the bones hard. And you need some cartilage here because you need your rib cage to expand a little bit. Everyone put your hands are like uh, on the lower parts of your ribs and then breathe deeply. Do you see how your rib cage moves just a little bit? And that's your costal cartilage. Uh, lamina, that's a part of your uh, vertebral arch. So let's look at what a laminectomy looks like. And don't people know I'm teaching? Laminectomy, laminectomy, there you go. So if I'm looking at a typical vertebrae, right? And uh, the lamina is like, you know, see these things that are stick, sticking out, right? Sometimes, right, they either have bone spurs or they start impinging on a nerve here. So we take it out. It's very, very delicate. We have to take it out because all of this is going to um, get messed up. And this thing right here, this is your intervertebral disc. There are discs in between all the vertebrae, right? And here's another picture. Here you go. See these discs and see the spinal nerve here? If you have a uh, intervertebral disc or a disc herniation, also known as a slip disc, it's gonna impinge on this nerve and it's gonna cause one or two things, either paralysis or a lot of shooting, shooting pain. And it's very painful. Uh, myelocele, bone marrow, also spinal cord, if there's any herniation or swelling. And the lamina is uh, part of that vertebral arch, one of those little like pointy things. It's not a pointy thing, but it's, it's sticking out and it's called a lamina. I sometimes have to remove it. Osteo means bone. So if I have osteitis, inflammation or infection of my bone. Osteoclast. Those are cells that clast or break down bones. Osteocyte is the mature bone cell. Osteoblast is the immature bone cell. And because of these three cells, always in cycling, especially if you're younger, it's called remodeling. 
It's the reason why bone is stronger than steel. Because steel, if I hit it with a hammer, it breaks or it bends. But bone, if I damage it, um, the osteoclast will break down the damaged piece. It'll promote osteoblast formation, which is the immature uh, bone cell. And then the immature bone cell matures and becomes the full-blown osteocyte. And that's called remodeling. And that cycle goes round and round. And especially for little ones, little kids, they could fall anywhere. I watched my little man this, just this morning, took a header from, uh, from the dining table. I don't know why he thinks he could jump from the dining table uh, um, uh, to his high chair and vice versa, but he tried and, and didn't quite make it. Nothing would happen. Now, if I tried doing that uh, at my age, someone's going to crack. And especially someone like my, uh, somebody like my mother who's in her 80s, so when you get older, be careful when you're walking up and down stairs. Be careful when you're walking around. Be careful when things are wet uh, because your bones are not as, um, as um, the remodeling of your bones is not as efficient as it was when you were younger. Desis, arthrodesis, we uh, use pins and these metal bands and all these things to uh, immobilize a joint. Maybe you guys seen that before, right? Let's look, look at a picture. This, it's better to look at a picture. See that? Put screws and pins and whatnots. And maybe you've ever seen a uh, halo. Um, ooh, boy. Look at this guy. Well, a halo... See like this, you ever seen that? In actuality, there's screws that are inside here that go right into your skull. And we could also do this halo on your femur as well, on long bones. Man, that's messed up. Ugh. I hate breaking bones. Thank goodness I stopped that tradition a while ago. Osteomalacia. That's when our Malaysia, uh, potato, potato, mal means bad, bad formation or softening of the bone. That also happens if your diet isn't good and you don't get enough calcium, enough magnesium in your diet. Diaphysis is the uh, long part of the bone. If you look at a long bone, this is your diaphysis, the long part. And of course, the epiphysis, epi means on top of, you know, and of course it has articular cartilage here on the ends. So it can reduce friction and uh, um, impact. Okay, but when you get older, like mine on my knee, all this is worn away from all stupidity of youth and, you know, playing, uh, Action jack. Oh, it's right here. So number one, diaphysis, dia, complete or thorough. And you can see here, just real quick note, human bone is a living, breathing thing. It can die. It has arteries, veins, and nerves. It has red marrow to make, um, uh, for hematopoiesis, to make red blood cells. It has yellow marrow to store um, uh, fat or adipose tissue for glucose. So it does a lot of things. So when you get cancer of the bone, it does a number on you. Osteomyelitis, right? The bone has what? Inflammation or infection. And that's not good because it's a, it's a living, breathing thing. Here's what I have to go through every once in a while, arthroscopy. Uh, they stick these holes, uh, one for irrigation. They usually either, they pump up this area either full of air or um, uh, saline, and then they have a viewing scope, and then they have this, I call it the rotor rooter And sometimes the viewing scope and the rotor rooter are combined, and they go in there and then they vacuum up, and then they, um, they cut up all the unnecessary garbage in, that's in here. I have a nice video of it.
of the last one they did on me a couple of years ago. Here's your hips, of course. Pelvimetry will measure the hips. Um, and you can see here's a total hip replacement example. How uh, they, they performed osteo, uh, osteodesis, they clamped all this down, but osteorexis, they take a hammer and chisel, not making this stuff up, and they crack away at all this. Oh, it's brutal, but it works. Here's the different kinds of fractures. Nice to know. You'll learn that in anatomy and physiology. Here's your different parts of your sp spine. Cervical, pertaining to your neck. Thoracic, pertaining to your thorax. Lumbar, pertaining to your loin or waist. And your sacrum here, which is your last five fused bones. And then your tailbone, which is called your coccyx. So you can go review that because a picture is worth a thousand words and then check your answers. But remember, your, 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 your textbook doesn't save things. So once you log out, it's out. Um, things regarding abbreviations. C1, like um, there are seven cerv cervical vertebrae. Or, or, uh, so we labeled them C1 through C7. There are five lumbar, we label them L1 through L5. There are 12 thoracic, we label them T1 through T12. And um, these could also be designations for the nerves that run, uh, uh, run accordingly. So when you hear C7, they could be talking about the seventh cervical vertebrae in orthopedics, or if it's neurology, they're talking about the seventh cervical nerve, okay? CT, ready to run, carpal tunnel syndrome. I've never seen it called CTS, but you never know. Fracture, this is common. Capital F with a lowercase x. HNP, hernias, herniated nucleus propulsus, also known as a herniated disc. And sometimes I see it. MG, myasthenia gravis, never seen that. But RA, seen that all the time. Rheumatoid arthritis. Patient has RA, that is a, um, it is a, um, autoimmune disease where my immune system or your patient's immune system attacks your joints because there's bone dust, there's things in your joints that don't look like your joint anymore due to damage or whatnot or due to age. And uh, your, your body attacks it. And how does your body attack things? It uh, utilizes inflammation and it gets painful. And then uh, you can't move too well, stiffness. Um, that's why... Um, uh, I, I religiously now do for the last couple of months, my morning stretching routine uh, that uh, um, Dr. Dan gave me, it's, it's helped immensely. I take less meds now um, um, because of my stretching routine. And because if I start, if I keep on losing the weight that I need to lose, I can move around much, much uh, more freely. Um, here's the nucleus propulsus. The nucleus propulsus is here, this, this spongy part, and the outer part is uh, cartilage. It's a little bit uh, more tough than the spongy part, but the nucleus propulsus, the spongy part, it could break down and you could have a herniated disc. And you could see here, it could impinge on this spinal nerve that's connected to your, um, uh, what do you call that, your spinal cord. Now, one way we could solve it is this. See this lamina or this little appendage sticking out here? If I cut this out and perform a laminectomy, it will alleviate uh, this pressure. And then I got to go in here and go, go fix this as well. This is my future when I get older. Um, uh, I just have swelling now, but when I'm in my uh, 70s, I'm going to get these things. I'm going to get these nodules. And this is new rheumatoid arthritis. They're called diprutrin nodules. And then eventually they're gonna, if you look at your grandmother or great grandmother, uh, look at their joints. Uh, my mother, it's, 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 it's not this bad, but it's on its way. But if you don't use it, you lose it. My mom says she has so, so much sensitivity in her hands, but every morning she purposefully does gardening and de-weeding and all that. And it makes her use her hands. And um, she takes far less meds than a lot of other patients I know. Um, my father's sister 
she can no longer use her hands, the, the nodules that are so bad. And you can't use your hands. What are you going to do all day? But it is what it is. When you get older, stuff happens. Uh, Talipes, equinovarus, and eh, nice to know. Oh, this is better than your spinal curvature. Normally, when you look at your patient laterally, there's a normal natural curvature. There's a natural curve here, natural curve here in the thoracic, natural curve in the lumbar. But if you look at your patient from back to front, posterior, posterior anteriorly, right, from the back to the front, if it's curved like this, especially if there's a misalignment with your scapula here, that's scoliosis. Humpback, kyphosis. Sway back, lordosis. And you could also see here, right? My stomach's all the way out to here, right? So it's going to pull against uh, the gravity of my stomach or if my patient has a, has a bigger stomach, you could see how it pulls on, um, uh, on your lumbar spine and it could cause a significant amount of um, back pain and uh, myalgia pain in that area. Also, um, I had... Um, I had a, I have several mentors in my life, but uh, when I when I went into the corporate world, uh, one of my mentors uh, was a Dr. Garza, and he told me something because uh, he knows I'm cheap, I'm a cheap guy, and he said, you know, the two things you can't the two things you can't be cheap about is your bed and your shoes. Your shoes, you walk around them all day. You got to protect your feet, and also you spend a third of your life sleeping. So pick your bed, pick a good bed. And I'm happy uh, that I took his advice because uh, all the beds in my house, I just, I pretty much didn't look at the price. And I just went, I just went to the, you know, uh, the Sealy Posturpedic guy and go, what is your best bed in this house? I lie down on it and I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. Um, and, and, uh, and I just, paid whatever I had to pay. Didn't even look, didn't look at the price and it was pricey. It hurt. Those of you who have uh, some, uh, um, um, you know, uh, a nicer bed, but I'm telling you when I sleep on, when, when I sleep on my bed, right. I am protecting myself against these. When I practice my stretching exercises, I'm protecting myself against this. When I eat a good diet and, uh, uh, um, and don't let my gut get out of control like it is now. I'm protecting myself. So you could see a lot of these things, even in orthopedics, it's preventable. There's a whole bunch of stuff that is preventable. Here's some, um, eh, it's nice to know, but this abbreviation you need to know, NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It's very, very common. And they're used for a whole bunch of, uh, uh, for a whole bunch of what they call the arthritides or all the types, different types of arthritis. Um, and they're nice because they're uh, over the counter and they're not steroids. Steroids do a number on your adrenal gland and, um, and it does a number on your kidneys. It also does a number on your inflammation process, which makes you immunocompromised. That's why I don't like handing out steroids. So, but this is much, much safer. And you know it better as ibuprofen and um, uh, acetaminophen, also known as Tylenol. And those are NSAIDs. All right, so what's your assignment for this week? You take this case, you copy and paste it, and then you have some questions. And the questions it goes, must directly re relate to two items. One, the case specifically, two, um, a medical term or and or abbreviation. So there's a whole bunch here. Let me just let me just take these. And also remember that other question I said. We can ask, what's uh, uh, what's our doctor's name? Uh, uh, what's the patient's name? Right. But more a better question would be, if Dr. Jeff Mayerson is writing a radiologic report, then what is his specialty? It's the Department of Radiology. So he should be looking at what? X-rays and whatnots. So again, I could take this, paste it, and I'm not, and let's make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. And don't you think I could, don't you think I could highlight? What views did we do? 
He had AP lat. Um, uh, which because uh, uh, he also had what sacral displacement of what lumbar sacral both neither. You could do that question. What did we perform? Right. What happened to the upper part of the lumbar? Yeah. Uh, which were okay. These. We took another view of what? This. What did we make the patient do? This, this, and there was slight motion at what levels? This, this. What was the diagnosis? That. So even with this small case, you could easily churn out questions. And the questions are directly related to the case and directly related to um, uh, medical terminology. Instead of doing this, uh, it, uh, uh, which is what I saw um, on, on some, some people's stuff. Well, the people who did turn it in. That's another thing I noticed. After week six, um, uh, the, the, I, see the, uh, I see the lack of discipline. And how do I know? Sunday night, when things are due for Monday morning, that's when all of you guys submit stuff. And then if I hear that, oh, it's the only time I have. No, it isn't. Because what? There are another, there's no other hours. I, I goes, I really goes, uh, and uh, like I said, you all don't want to know my schedule, right? There's always time. And if you do things early, right? Uh, the odds of you getting better grades, the odds uh, goes, uh, the odds of you getting better feedback and quicker feedback, because imagine you got the feedback today, you did stuff last night versus why didn't you do it last Monday? Why didn't you do it be before? Because if, if, if everything's last minute, what would the, what would the quality be? Right. Um, my papers are due Sunday midnight. When did I do them? I did them Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, because I need the feedback for Saturday. And then if my professor has feedback, I can now ask the professor, hey, if I rewrite this in this section, can, do you think you can give me an A minus? And my professor goes, yeah, sure, write it by tonight. Now, everyone who submitted it, like the majority of the class submitted 11.30 on a Sunday evening, right? And it also goes to, sh it also goes to show um, that particular student, that particular person just has simple poor, uh, poor time management. So again, a course like this is an aceable course. You really should have an A in this course. Uh, I'm just going to be brutally honest. You don't get an A in this course. It's something up. That means you, you in, in nine times out of 10, it's usually um, a poor time management. And, uh, and isn't that what we do um, in, in medical? We have a ton of patients. We have limited time to go see them. So your time management and your uh, priority management management is really important. And um, I just, I'm, I'm I always promote these things called a Gantt chart, which is this. <clears throat> this is what a Gantt chart is. You have things to do and you prioritize them, okay? You could use uh, Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft Excel. And then you, let's say for example, this one's better looking. Let's say, for example, like this is this is the month you're in, and something's due all the way out here. You you make a deadline here, a week prior, and you do it by priorities. I got to do this, 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 and then that project will be done. I got to do this, 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 this. And don't you think if you organized your life that way, you'd never be late, you'd never miss an assignment. Um, in the in the, uh, in the two years that I've been in this uh, current master's degree program, uh, the only times I missed assignment is because I didn't listen to my Gantt chart. I didn't listen to, uh, uh, to the schedule. And now I also, I also put leisure time in my schedule because remember, we all can't be automatons. You can't be a robot. You, you need to have balance, right? Especially, uh, uh, especially when you're sick, okay? Um, you need to have that balance. You need to be able to heal up. So on that note, what's due next week?
Chapter 10, Medical Language Laboratories, which is exercise, uh, list, critical listening exercises one, two, and three, and response exercise one and two. And remember, the practice is just practice. These are the things that are due. Of course, uh, don't forget your quiz. And the discussion forum for this week is... Create a multiple choice exam based on one of the musculoskeletal cases that we went that uh, were highlighted this week. Musculoskeletal, I spelled okay. Now, the quiz, the quiz should have five questions. Each question should have four answers, A, B, C, and D, at least. Okay? And this is due. And next week, uh, next week we're on campus, I believe. So this is due by 9 a.m. Uh, uh, May 3, 2021. Next week, we will be on campus. Fourth floor, uh, Health Lab 1, Alexandria campus. Uh, please wear mask and, and scrubs if you have. Uh, please uh, minimize uh, uh, the amount of personal items to bring to school, to the campus, to the university, for heaven's sakes. Um, and then all social, you know, all social distancing, whatnot, what, what, what not. And just like as a little side note, according, uh, according to the New York Times, half this country is already vaccinated. Interesting. Then why are the numbers not getting affected? Something to think about, right? Again, Dr. Garay's conspiracy theorist checking in. So with all that being said, it is at this point, I'm going to stop the recording, make the video available, of course.